All right, so maybe, so maybe let's start. Uh, so we are delighted to have uh, Shachar Lovett uh, giving us this uh, invited talk. Shachar is an associate professor in the computer science department at UCSD. He obtained his PhD from Weizmann Institute, did a two-year postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and has been a faculty member at uh, University of California, San Diego, SANS. He's done um, in work in so many areas and had major contribution uh, to structure versus randomness, loading degree polynomials, coding theory, pseudo-randomness, additive combinatorics, higher order free analysis, communication complexity, and especially the log rank conjecture, discrepancy theory, machine learning, in particular active learning, and combinatorics. He's a recipient of the NSF Career Award, Sloan Fellowship, the Dan David Prize, and his uh, recent joint work on the Sunflower Conjecture won the Stock 2020 Best Paper Award. And that's what he's going to tell us about today. He's going to tell us about this line of work and this surprising connection to random restriction and DNF diversification. Uh, so I'm very happy uh, to have Shachar as our speaker. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Avishai. Thank you for this very kind introduction. And thanks you know, the organizers for inviting me. So everything I want to tell you about today has been done joint work with, you know, three amazing people. So Ryan Elwise, who's a grad student at Princeton, Kewen Wu, who was an undergrad at Peking University, is now, you know, in Stanford, actually a student of Avishai, and Jia Peng Zhang, who started as a UC faculty this year. Um, and really, like Avishai said, um, Part of this work is related to the sunflower conjecture, but really what I want to tell you about more is about this random restrictions aspect. And so here's basically the overview of this talk. That I'm assuming like most of you, or maybe all of you know that random restrictions are very, very useful in our area. And like the most famous example is a Hastad switching lemma. And it said that if you're given a DNF, and I mean more generally AC0 secret, but let me talk about DNFs here. If you fix most of the inputs, then somehow this it simplifies. And I'll, I'll talk more about it you know, in a bit, but basically the fact that you need to fix most of the inputs is a bottleneck in various areas trying to get better bounds. And what I want to tell you about are, you know, how can you get things to work if you only do mild runner restrictions? By mild, I mean, you only fix a small fraction of the inputs. And actually, I want to tell you about two types of results that we had on mild random restrictions because um, I'm hoping that the people might be able to use this or sort of similar ideas to other problems. So here's a plan for the talk. I'm going to start maybe for the first 15 minutes talking about background on random restrictions. And in particular, I'm going to give like a highlight of you no know, proof of like a baby version of the Hustle switching lemma. Uh, so that we're all on the same page here. And then I want to talk about two types of results that allow us to move beyond the need to fix almost all the variables. So one would be assuming something about the structure of the DNF, that it is to the random in a certain way. And the other one would be for arbitrary DNFs, but would change our sort of objective in what we're trying to achieve. And then I'll speak about open problems. And again, these two results, I want to tell you sort of independent. Um, so just if you lose me on one, then you can join on the other. And again, like Avishai said, please feel free to ask talks, questions, or interject, or you know, make suggestions. Or what, I mean, I'm hoping for this to be as interactive as possible. OK, so let's start with the background. So in this talk, what we're going to have are Boolean functions, you know, from n bits to 1 bit. And what we're going to be studying are restrictions of functions. So what is a restriction if they take my inputs and I fix some of them to some value, zero or one. So we're going to denote restrictions by row, and row is some in some some element of zero, one start with the n. So zeros or ones are the values I fix, and star are the free variable, the live variable that I haven't fixed so far. And in particular, we're going to study random restrictions where we fix some random p fraction of the inputs to random values. Now, when you talk about random restriction, there are two variants you could be considering, and, and the most moral is the same. I mean, one is that you just say, well, I'm going to fix some exactly some number of inputs to some values. 
So if I want to fix the p fraction, I want to fix exactly p times n inputs to 0 or 1, and the rest are going to keep free. Or another variant is just do it independently for every variable, fix it to be 0 or 1 with probability p. And again, in this talk, I won't really be distinguishing between these two variants because they're basically the same. I mean, you can, there are not much differences between them. And again, the goal would be that somehow with high probability, when you do that, your function simplifies. So maybe pictorially, if this was your function to begin with, then after fixing some variables to 0 and 1, now it becomes somehow simpler. Um, and again, the type of functions I'll be considering in this talk are just going to be DNFs. I'm going to keep it simple, just DNFs. So everything from now on, when we have a function, is going to be a DNF. What is a DNF? Again, I'm assuming you all know what a DNF is, but just to make sure that, that really you all know, so a DNF is going to be all of end of literals. So a literal is either a verbal or it's negation. So here we have, you know, so everything we do end of literal. So here x1, not x3, not x4, they're all literals. So the end is called a term. And a DNF is an all of terms. This is a DNF. There are going to be two natural parameters associated with the DNF. One is the size, which is the number of terms you need here, like in this case, four. And the other parameter is the width, which is the maximal size of a term, the maximum number of variables in any term, which in this case is called, it's going to be three. So again, just remember these two parameters. Size is a number of terms. Width is a maximal size of a term. And so here is a switching lemma. And the switching lemma was first proved by Hastad, and then so the proof was simplified by Rasborov and by Beam. And it says the following thing. So let's let's read it together. So we're going to have a width W DNF. So making no assumption of the size, just a width of every term has at most W variables. We're choosing a random restriction, P random restriction, where we fixed almost all of the inputs. So we fix one minus one over let's say 10 W. Out of one over W. So so we fix almost all of the variables to constant, 0 or 1, but we keep something like 1 over w alive. So some fraction, small fraction stays alive, the rest gets fixed. And I'm going to denote the restricted function by f of rho. So f of rho is always going to denote the restriction of f under rho. So it's still a function, which is a function on the unrestricted input, the one that I set to star here. And the switching lemma says, if you take this function, it really simplifies a lot. In particular, the decision tree depth of it is going to be small with high probability. But just to keep it simple, let's look at this, what's called the baby version of it. It says, well, what's the probability that after you fix all these variables, the function becomes constant? And the baby version says, well, it's going to be pretty high. Now, of course, if you fix all the variables, the function is going to be constant with probability 1. And, and this, this lemma said, well, if you fix almost all the variables, it's going to be constant with high probability. And the proof of this lemma is based on an encoding argument and i want to go through the proof because we're going to see similar encoding arguments later on and i think this is a good place to start in you know in, in the lemma that most of you have seen and the proof that most of you have seen and how do we use encoding arguments so in fact for this set of parameters where we fix almost all of them then actually we get even something more than 50 50%, 90%. So let's say I want to prove to you that my DNF, if I fixed almost all of the inputs, is constant with very high probability. So I'm going to use two definitions here. RK is going to denote all the restrictions where we'll have K variables that stay alive, so those stars, and the rest of the variables, N minus K of them, I fix to random value, 0 or 1. So whenever I fix a an input to a value is going to be either 0 or 1, 50, 50. And I'm going to do by bad k, all these restrictions where the function did not become constant. Okay, so these are the bad restrictions. And I want to show that the bad restrictions are only a small fraction of all the restrictions. So rk are all the restrictions, bad k are the ones that happen to be bad, where the function did not become constant. So how are we going to show that? We're going to define an injective function, an um, mapping from all the bad restrictions that fix that have k variables stay alive into the following range. There are going to be restrictions where you're going to have one variable less that's alive. So I fix one more variable. So it's rk minus 1. And some extra information. In this case, this extra information is going to be some index between 1 and w. 
And I'm claiming if you can build such an injective function, then this would show what we want. Why? What is our regime of parameters? In our regime of parameters, almost all of the variables have been fixed. So if I ask how many restrictions do I have that fix one more variable, it's going to be a much, much smaller number. And if you do the calculation, it's going to be like, you know, 1 over 10 W, fraction of the other restrictions of RK. Fixing one more variable really reduces the number of restrictions by a lot, by a factor of 10 W. So even if I use some extra information that has W options, I still am going to get at a factor of 10. So this would show that the number of bad restrictions that keep K variables alive is at most 10% of all the restrictions that keep K variables alive. So with high probability, 90%, my function on the restriction is going to be constant. Okay, that's, that's a high level idea of any of these type of encoded arguments. So, you know, all of the challenging part is in how do we construct such an injective function somehow using the structure of the DNF and using the assumption that the restriction is not constant. Okay, this is where all the magic happens. Now, are there any questions at this point? I mean, I'm assuming many people have seen this before, but, but now maybe a good time to ask questions about this general approach. Okay, I see some question here. In the, in the case of F is constant, would I expect the value to be true? Um, not necessarily. So in this case, in our scenario, no. We don't really try to distinguish whether it's true or false. Because for example, it could be that my DNF is going to be on a, on, on a completely random input is going to be 50-50. True or false, or that we want this to be the same, or we expect it to be the same for all this type of, you know, fixing almost all of the variables. So I'm not just trying to understand whether the value of the function is true or false. I'm just trying to understand whether it's constant or not constant. So whether it's more likely to be true or false depends on the, the specific DNF being considered. It's a very good question. Any other questions? Okay, so maybe I'll continue. And if you have any more questions, you can feel free to ask them in the chat or interrupt me. So how do we build this, this, this injective function? So I want to encode bad, bad k are the bad restrictions that fix k variables, k variables stay alive as a pair, row prime and an index. Row prime is a restriction that has k minus one variables that stay alive, so one variable less and another index between one and W. How do I do that? So here's a process. So first I take my DNF. Remember DNF is an all of terms, each term is an end of laterals, and I just fix some order of these terms, some arbitrary order I fixed in advance, okay? And now let's say, remember we're assuming f of rho is not fixed, so it's not constant zero, not constant one, so one of these terms stays alive, and they don't all become zero, and not one of the, and it's not true that one of them becomes one. So let's take the first surviving term, and let's take the first star in this first surviving term under this restriction. So the first variable in this surviving term that I haven't fixed. And I'm going to find the following restriction, row prime. I'm going to take my restriction row, and I'm now I'm going to fix one more variable to 0, 1, which variable is variable xj. I'm going to fix it to a value 0, 1, so that this term stays alive. So I mean, if this variable xj appears in ti positively, I'm going to fix it to 1. And if it, if it appears to be negated, I'm going to fix it to zero. So either way, I choose either zero or one, so this term stays alive. So this is how I define row prime. That's the first part of the encoding. This is how I fix one more variable. Now I also need this index. What is this index? This index is going to be the following thing. I'm going to use this notation throughout the talk. So I'm going to have, in this case, the variables of my term, ti that you, that I have W options here. And I'm asked, xj is one of these variables. So which one is it? Is the first one, the second one? Assuming in each term, I also fix uh, some arbitrary ordering on the variables in it. So xj is one of them. Maybe it's the first one or the second one or the third one. I have w options. So I tell you which one is it. A number between one and w. And that's going to be the index. Shachar, just a... Yes. So if xj is like the only variable that stays alive in this term, and then you just fix it so that the term would be right, satisfied, right? So exactly, like in this exactly. case, you cannot, you cannot make TI like survive, but... So by survive, I mean not to die. Okay. So survive means either it stays alive or it becomes satisfied. 
Mm-hmm. There are two options, right? If, if XJ is the only variable that's alive, that stayed alive, I fix it to some value, now TI becomes satisfied. The other option, there are more variables. In this case, it's, it's it didn't die. So get maybe maybe a better phrasing would be sort of they didn't kill TI. Okay. okay. Uh, Shahar? Yes. If you um, fix it so that one of the terms uh, becomes one, so like if if TI is now sort of always satisfied, doesn't that make F identically one? So if you're asking before or after the restriction? Uh, like when you when you set the value of xj and somehow you set it so that you don't kill ti, but as Avishai said, if you know xj is like the only variable left, mm-hmm. um, then you sort of make that clause uh, true, but then f becomes constant, which is I thought what we wanted to. Avoid. Yes, no, but what we're trying to analyze is f becoming constant under row. So when I have k variable that I didn't fix. And part of the proof we're going to construct row prime, but actually we're not going to go care really whether f under row prime is constant or not. Ah. So we're not going to try. So row prime is just part of the analysis. This yeah. is not the event. The event is whether f over row is constant or not. Row prime is going to come in the analysis. Gotcha. Okay, and I see there's one more question in the chat. So Tony is asking, maybe easier way to say it, that we set the literal in ti involving xj to true. Yeah, that's that's. A that's true. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Good. A- any more question? No. Okay. So let's continue. So now I'm claiming, so now we define the encoding, and I'm claiming that this encoding is reversible. I mean, it's an injective function. So given this row prime and index, I can recover row. So because I can reverse the process, it proves this is an injective function, right? I cannot map two different restrictions that are better restrictions into the same pair, row, prime, and index. So let's just build, let's just do this process. We're going to sort of, sort of algorithmically reverse engineer row from row, prime, and index. So let's see what do we say. So we will start with having row, prime, and this index. And then same, same claim that given row, prime, I can find ti. Why? I go through all the terms in f under row, prime, and I'm asking, which one is the first term that is either satisfied or not killed in f row prime, right? This is what, also what Avishai said. So I'm going through the terms. Which was the first term that is not that, 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 that is not zero, meaning either it's satisfied equal one, or all the variables in it that were fixed were fixed to the right value that this term is not killed. And ti is going to be the first one. By the way, we construct this encoding so we can recover ti from this in, in, information now given ti and given this index now i know that the, i know the index of the verbal i chose to fix inside my um term so now i know what is j so i can recover xj right so now i know both Ti and I know xj. Now, how do I construct row prime? I fix to some value. So, what do I do to construct row? I just remove this value. So, given row prime and j, I can recover row by just make it say, making this value become star. And this recovers row. So, this is a process. We just go through this information and we sort of slowly, step by step, recover all the pieces of information that we use to construct the encoding. At, so at the very end, we can recover the row that you wanted to recover. So this is it. But there's nothing sort of you know deep going on here. It just we chose the encoding in a way that would allow us to easily recover the restriction. So this is a proof of the sort of you know the baby version of the switching lemma. Questions? Okay. Away. So Pranav is asking, again, ti was the first term which was true or constant. So t- it cannot be true. If a term was true under row, then f would be fixed, right? If a term became true, f is fixed. So we're assuming no term under row is true, and at least one term did not become f- you know, false. So there has to be a term with some variable 
surviving in it. Okay. Any more questions? I mean, I think it's good that people understand this argument because we're going to see similar arguments when we're going to start to study mild random restrictions. And this is a similar, simpler encoding. Okay, so I'll continue. Okay, so this is what we've seen so far. And again, one of the caveats of this switching lemma is that we require to fix almost all of the inputs. And you can ask, is this necessary? And the answer is yes. I mean, look, for example, here's a tribes function. A tribes function is this sort of, you no know, read once DNF. And we know that sort of, you no, know, if you're hoping to make this constant, you really have to fix almost all of the inputs. So this, this switching lemma and even the baby version of it are tight. So we cannot hope to do more in general. So the question is, well, how can we hope to get some leverage from only fixing a small fraction of the inputs? So this is what I want to tell you about. So I want to tell you about two types of new, new mild random restrictions that work even when we fix a small fraction of the inputs, let's say 1%. The first one is going to be if we assume that the DNF is not arbitrary, but pseudo-random in a certain sense. And this was of the main machinery that we used to get these improved bonds for the sunflower lemma. Uh, this was this joint work with Ryan, Kevin, and Jiapeng. And this other work is a different type of a mild random restriction that works for arbitrary DNF, but here we're changing our goal. We're not trying to make the DNF constant. We're just trying to control its size. And this is also a joint work with Kevin and Jiapeng. And here, this was the main machine we used to get sort of, you know, tight bounds on DNF compression. But anyway, in this talk, I, write, I just want to focus on the restriction part and not on the application part. And again, my main hope is that people could use these ideas or similar ideas for other types of problems on DNFs and other functions. So let's talk, let's switch gears now and talk about pseudo random restrictions for pseudo random DNFs. So here's my DNF, and I'm going to say it's to the random if no variable or maybe a small group of variables appear in too many terms. And here's the formal definition. We say this DNF is K spread, K is some parameter, at least one. If it satisfies the following condition, for any number T, consider any T variables and ask, in how many terms do these T variables appear together? And the condition is going to be, this, this is going to be a small number, m over k to the t. So we have this exponential decay. The, the more verbals you have, they should appear in fewer and fewer terms together. And k is controlling that of, you know, our uh, exponential decay. The larger k is, the more pseudo-random the DNF is. And maybe the extreme cases where all the terms are disjoint. Right? That's the most pseudo-random DNF you could have. So just to make sure we're all clear, so... In particular, every variable appears in at most m over k terms, every pair in at most m over k squared terms, and so on. So m is a number of terms in my original DNF, and k is this parameter we're using to control this rate of decay. And just to make sure that we're all on the same page, here's a very simple claim. If f has this w and is k spread, it must have some minimal number of terms, k to the w. Why? And the proof is very simple. Just consider one term. A single term has w variables in it, and they all appear together in one term. So if I hope that my DNF is k-spread, I must have at least k to the w terms in it. Um, so in particular, if we go back to tribes, tribes is two-spread. So this parameter k I could choose cannot be more than two. So in that sense, tribes is not a very pseudo-random DNF, but you could, so you could hope to do better. And again, here's just the definition, and, and the main theorem we proved and then is something of the following thought. So let P be some parameter that is you know, positive parameter and assume F is K spread for K being something like log W over P. So if K is big enough, you know the exact, you know, you know um, exact quantity for now, if K is big enough, then P random restrictions make F constant high probability. The whole point here is that I can choose P to be whatever parameter I want. It doesn't have to be, you know, very close to one. In fact, I can choose it to be very, very close to zero by, let's say, even a, um, by making sure that my DNF is pseudo-random enough. 
So I want to tell you some of the ideas that are going to this proof, but they're also going to be based on encoding arguments. Yes. Does this need to be true for all t, or can one work with a smaller bounded range of t? Okay, great question. So here I'll be assuming this is true for all t. And in fact, the interesting regime is where t is big. This is where we're going to get most of the leverage. So yeah, we need t to be big. Maybe Shachar, can you give maybe an example of um, something that is more spread than tribes? Yes, like if we go back to this tribe example. Sorry, how do I go here? Go back. If you go to this tribes example, but we don't have O of 2 to the W these joint terms, we get O of K to the W these joint terms. I just have more these joint terms, that's going to be K spread. So just changing two to k here is going to make this k, make this k spread, but that's going to be like a very trivial case, right? Like tons and tons and tons of terms. This DNF is just going to be a very, very high probability one on almost all inputs. Right. But I'm going to show you an, an more interesting example later, but but for now that's maybe a good starting example. Okay. I think there's another question in the chat. Oh, thanks. Perfect. Okay. Good. So maybe the model in your mind should be something like tons and tons and tons of these joint terms, but not really. So really we're gonna have this sort of pseudo random condition. So what's gonna be the proof idea? So here's a theorem. The main idea is gonna be that if you fix something like P over log W fraction of inputs, it's gonna reduce the width from W to W over two. Cause that's gonna be the high level idea. So fixing a small fraction of input is gonna reduce the width a lot. So if you repeat this log w times, we're done. We're going to get a constant function. And the proof is again going to be an encoding argument, but this time a different encoding argument. So I just want to focus on how do we reduce the width. That's the main part, width reduction. So we have a restriction. Here's my restriction. So I fix some small, now it's going to be a small fraction of inputs fixed to 0 and 1. And now most of the inputs stay unfixed tau. And I'm going to take one of these terms that didn't die. So it's, it's consistent with rho. So maybe most of its inputs are stars, but the few that I happen to fix, I fix to the right value. So the term didn't die. Now here's going to be the, the crucial definition. I'm going to say this term is compressible if there is some other term, tj, in my DNF that satisfies two properties. First of all, if I know that ti is true and I know that the restriction rho is true, I can deduce that tj is true. So you can pictorially think of it as tj being a subset of ti in this restriction is in, in the sense that every literal in tj is either a literal in ti or is set this for restriction. That's one part. And also tj, in tj I fixed many variables. Let's say I fixed at least half the variables in tj. So it has at most w over two alive variables in it. So maybe ti itself was sort of, you know, it stayed alive, but most of the variables, because I only fixed a tiny fraction. Imagine I fixed like 1% of the variables to, to 0, 1. So in a typical term, I fixed 1% of the variables. So I'm not hoping for TI itself to, you know, be almost, like have many variables been fixed, but maybe TI implies some other TJ, and TJ itself has many variables that's fixed. In this case, TI is compressible. And the whole point is under this restriction, I can just replace ti with tj. I don't need ti anymore, right? If tj is one of my terms in my DNF, it implies by ti restriction, I can just remove ti from my DNF under row. So I'm just going to keep tj. So my, my goal is to prove to you is that in a DNF that's to the random, most terms are compressible. Okay, so we can remove them, and then we can continue this process. So, you know, Really what you're analyzing is not the width, but some average width, but ignore these are all technical details. So this is the high level picture. Most terms are going to be compressible. And how are we going to show this by an encoding argument? So I want to encode to you here a pair. It's going to be a restriction row and a term ti that is consistent with row, but is bad. It's not compressible. And I want to claim that I can encode it in an efficient way and show that most terms are going to be compressible. So how do I encode it? So first, we're going to take row prime to be row, and I'm also going to fix ti to be true. So all the variables in ti that I haven't fixed so far, and I'm going to fix them so that you know if they appear positively, I fix this variable to one. If they appear negatively, I fix it to be zero. So ti now now all the variables in ti are now fixed, and 
this is different than the encoding the Hasan switching element. I fixed all of them. This is all prime. And now I'm going to encode some more information. Now let's think about row prime and let TJ be the first term satisfied by row prime. Now TJ might be TI or it might be some other term. I know TI is satisfied by prime, but there might be some other previous. Remember, I fix some ordering over my terms to begin with, some arbitrary ordering. I take TJ to be the first term that is satisfied. And I'm going to take now the fine V to be all these variables that are in common between TI and TJ. Like in this picture, it's going to be all these variables here in this intersection. And index one is going to be the following thing. I'm going to take all the variables of TJ, V is some subset of it, and I'm just going to index the subset as part of you know these things. It's going to be, you know, so we're going to calculate the, the, the side. I think it's going to be two to the W options. So index one is, you know, among all possible subsets of the variables of TJ, which one of it happens to be V, which are the common variables to TI and TJ, to the first index. Now, given V, let FV be all the terms in my DNF that contain V. Now I identified somehow some set of variables that all appear in my term TI. Now V could be B, could be small. We're going to argue about this at the end. But I'm just going to take all the terms that happen to contain V. TI is one of them. So I'm going to take this set. I'm going to some arbitrarily index its elements. I'm going to take what is the index of TI here? That's going to be the second index. And then I'm, the, the last piece of information is going to be what is the value of my restriction row on TI? So it's this bits here. Right, which ones are zero, one, which one are stars. And that's going to be my encoding. So I mean, ignore the details for a second. I'm going to take a restriction row prime and some other piece of information. And this is going to be my encoding. And my claim is that first of all, this encoding is injective. And second, that it really compresses it, row and TI. So let's, let's just briefly see both. First, why it's injective? Well, there's no mystery here. You can actually go through and see that you can actually recover everything piece by piece. I know row prime, I can recover TJ because it's just the first term satisfied by row prime. So I do the same thing, just take the first one. Now, if I know TJ and I know index one, and then I know variable TJ, I know V, I can just recover V. If I know V, I can just compute FV. I know the index and compute TI. And given this piece of information, I even recover row. So you can just go through it, you know, later if you want. There's no, this is just going through the steps one by one Nothing deep going on here, just recover everything. So all of the magic is happening by showing that this really is a compression. This really decreases the, side, the, the amount of information we need. So why? And here you're going to see why this pseudo-random condition was useful. So here just off, at the bottom, I wrote this encoding procedure. So why do we get some savings? Well, let's first make two crucial observations. First of all, I'm claiming that because TI is not compressible, Whatever TJ I'm choosing, it must have many, many variables in common with TI. Because if it had very few variables, TJ would have been mostly inside the restriction part. So TJ would be a compression of TI. So because I'm assuming there is no compression of TI, TJ, which is some term consistent with TI, must have many variables in common with TI. And if you do the calculation, it's going to be W over 2. And secondly, because of this pseudo-randomness or regularity assumption that we have, if I tell you, if I give you many variables inside TI, there are not many terms that are consistent, that, that contain these variables. So this index two part this has a few options. Now let's do the calculations. So this is what we're going to use the pseudo randomness assumption, that if I give you some variables inside TI, it really reduces by a lot the number of terms I need to consider. Now let's do the calculations. So first of all, before the compressions, how many pairs of restrictions and terms do I have? Well. Number of restrictions is going to be RPN, and I'm sort of changing my definition before. Now RPN is going to denote the number of restrictions where I fix a small number of variables, PN. So most of the variables are sort of stayed alive. And M is just a number of terms in my DNF. That's a amount of information I'm trying to compress. And now assuming that TI was not compressible, let's see. How much do I compress it by? So row prime is this new restriction 
where I fixed some number of variables, some values, the one here in TI that was stars, some number between one and W, and W is the worst case. And you do calculations, behaves like the restrictions we had, but now you lose something. Now, because most of the variables were stars, fixing more variables is going to increase the number of restrictions, not decrease them, like in the hashtag switching lemma proof. Now it's going to increase, but increase in some controlled rate, one over P for every variable I fix. So overall, I fix at most W more new variables. So I'm going to increase the number of restrictions by one over P to the W. That's bad for us. Now, the first index, just some subset of a set of size W, it's going to be two to the W options. And here's going to be all the magic. The number of options for the second index is going to be all the terms, but I get saving. Why? Because I know that my term that I'm trying to compress TI is not an arbitrary term. term. I know that there's this set of, you know, W over two variables that I, I know I must, they must be contained inside it. So, and by my assumption on so the randomness, I have much, much fewer terms like that. I save k to the power w over two. So if I choose k to be big enough, it's gonna overcome this p to the w term. That's where all the magic happens. And then again, this last information has some bound number of options. So you have the calculations, and you get that to get this to work, you need this sort of pseudo randomness one but second with the question. So this sort of pseudo randomness is some function of P, some poly one over P. Yes, now let's see the question. So it's a product, not a vision. I don't understand the question. What is a product, not a division? P is less than one, yes. So by dividing by P to the W, actually increase this by a lot, right? This is more. The side of row prime is more than the side of row. So dividing by P to the W increases the number. Yes, it's in, divided by P to the W increases the number. So row prime has more options in row, but uh, my, my saving coming from this term part, index two. So in particular, you're not encoding only a restriction, but the pair, right? A restriction and a Term. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm calling the pair, Are that's you? right. So, so Lily's asking, can you elaborate on the sense in which k spread is a pseudo-randomness condition? Yes, yeah, so think of the, maybe the ideal case, the model case is just all the, ter all the terms being disjoint. Or maybe just you choose like each term to be random, but the universe is so large, so that the is high probably going to be close to this joint. So that's maybe one sense of it being considered. Just random terms in a large enough domain, so they're going to be more disjoint. Okay, yeah. So I, <clears throat> what I was wondering about is it, it seems like n has to factor in to that, like the condition. And so you're saying we should think of n as very large for thinking of it as a pseudo random. Yes, condition? yes, yes. So you need to sort of choose n so that you're going to get that. So maybe the choosing term of n is something like k to the w. Thanks. Yes, I agree. This doesn't quite model random DNFs, so in that sense, maybe it's not like a really a pseudo random condition, but but it is at least spiritually some sort of a pseudo random condition. So, so really, what we say that no variable or few variables have a kind of influence on my DNF. Here, influence is measured not in the standard influence sense, but in this sort of white box sense of how many terms it, it, it is. Wrong. So. And what I was asking a question about relaxing to the randomness. If one defines a distribution on t-tuples with probability proportional to the number of occurrences, does it suffice to bound the Shannon entropy? You bound mean entropy. Um, this is a good question. Um, I'm suspecting that something like that could be true. I mean, what we, what we can show is something more general than what's here. I mean, you can define a distribution of terms. Doesn't have to be so just counting terms. And it's even enough that it's true for some subs of the term. So I'm, I think maybe maybe yes, but I'm not 100% sure. Maybe, but maybe yes. Thanks. Um, I think in particular, I'll put the beef. Some of the, there were some, some later proofs using information theory. And I think some of them actually maybe can be adapted to use Shannon directly. Shannon to be directly. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, good questions. More, more questions? 
Now, one thing about this proof, this, this proof doesn't actually give you the best parameter. So, I mean, maybe it's not clear from here, but really what you would like to get is something like one of, so for the like optimal parameters, you'd like K to be something like one over P. For like really, really tight parameters. And if you do this type of calculations, you get one over P squared. So you can say, well, maybe I don't choose W over two, I choose some other parameters. So this is what we did in the paper. And you can get it almost to be one over P, but you lose some lower order terms here. So really, you know, the proof the theorem I told you is not the one we got. We got this almost that. So we lost some log log type terms here. And there was this sort of follow-up work by Frankston, Khan, Narayanan, and Park. And they actually improved the above bound. And, and the reason they cared about it was that I wasn't aware of originally, which, which is if you get this bound, they actually prove a really nice conjecture by Talagrand called the fractional expectation conjecture, which I'm not going to talk about here, but it's a really, really neat well now result that shows that a lot of results in, in random graph theory that previously had very hard, so if, you know, ad hoc proofs, now all have this very streamlined, unified proofs that is very easy to verify. So things like, you know, if they have like a random graph, what is the threshold to get like, you know, a, a matching or a Hamiltonian cycle or anything like that, now you can get like a very uh, unified approach to that. Well, before there were like very ad hoc, you no know, proofs for each one individually. And also there was this stuff of more, more recent proofs, one by Anu Prao, last year and one very recent one by Terry Tau, using information theory to really sort of simplify some of the calculations here and, and, and give like a more straight proof. So they get, they get the same bounds as the one that, that sort of Franks and Al got, but, but the proof is simpler. And, and also maybe, like, like Madhu was saying, maybe this would also allow you to sort of relax the assumption that maybe you don't need to, to control mean entropy, but you know, maybe Shannon entropy or other entropy. I think that's a very interesting possibility. So, and, and also related to what Salil was asking, so he was asking about, you know, as to the random condition. So I also want to give you a construction, a very simple construction that this bound is tight. You can't hope to do better. So here's the construction. Again, this is not going to be random, but it's going to be sort of random looking in a certain sense. So here's the, the instance. So you're given a K times W variables, and they're arranged in a grid. And my DNA is going to be that says in every row there is a one. And so a term is going to be you choose every possible option for an index in a row. You take this 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 term, you take all of them, and you can check that this is a DNF, it has with W. K to W terms, it is K, well, not regular, but spread here, sorry, K spread. But you really need P to be, you know, I mean, it's not going to, if you choose P so that K is something like log W over P, it's not going to make it constant. So to this show that this type of result is, is the best you could hope for. So then I'm getting short on time, let me sort of switch to this sort of other random restriction. So just to summarize, for general DNFs, we need to fix almost all the restrictions, almost all the inputs to make it constant. But for pseudo-random DNFs, this definition, it's enough to fix a small fraction of problems. Now, let me switch gears to a different type of a mild restriction. So if you, so if you lost me somewhere, then now it's a good time to sort of switch back in. And here, I'm going to not assume anything about the DNF. It's going to be an arbitrary DNF, but I'm going to change my goal. I'm going to try to control DNF size. So here's going to be the result I want to show to you. So I get an arbitrary DNF, no assumptions on it. Row the P random restriction. So remember, I fix P fraction of the inputs to 0, 1. So I think of P as maybe 1%. And I'm going to claim that with high probability, this restricted DNF, the number of terms surviving in it is going to be at most something like 1 over P to the W. Some, so some control, so just to know. This bound does not depend on the number of terms in the original DNF, M. And also, again, here we can take P to be anything we want. It could be like 1%. And we still get a meaningful bound. And again, this was the main ingredient is this new result we had in stock this year with Kevin and Japan on giving some tight bounds on DNF compression. Okay, so what are the ideas here? Again, that's a result. 
again, it's going to be an encoding argument, but a different type of an encoding argument. And here, really, what we're going to do is we're going to use a restriction as a way of communicating a message. So I'm going to view a restriction as some sort of a communication channel. And that's going to be different than the previous use of, of, of a restriction. So here, we're not going to fix the first term or something like that. We're going to say there's going to be this extra information I want to send. And I'm going to choose my encoding as a way of also sending this extra information along this channel. So maybe before doing that, let me just sort of, let all of us just sort of briefly see how can a restriction kill terms or affect terms. I mean, my goal is to prove that the restriction, the random restriction, reduces the number of terms. So it's good to sort of check in what ways can restriction reduce the number of terms. And there are three ways. It can kill terms, it can satisfy terms, and it can merge terms. Let's see examples of three of them. So here's my DNF. Here's a restriction. If I set, let's say, x1 to 0 and x2 to 1, it's going to kill the first two terms, right? So restriction can kill terms. That's, that's, that's going to reduce the number of terms. A restriction can satisfy some term. Like in this case, a restriction satisfies the second term, in which case the entire DNF just becomes one. So I don't care about the other terms. And the third option, it could merge terms. If they fix you know, x2 to 1 x3 to 0, I'm going to merge the first two terms to become x1. Right. In this case, I also kill the third term, but just for the example, let's fix, consider the first two terms, they become merged to a single term, right? So again, a restriction can either kill a term, it could satisfy a term, or it could merge terms. So let's take my DNA. Oh, there was a question here. Five minutes. Okay, perfect. So let's take my DNF, and let's assume that my I of row, you know, all the terms are survived. And this means that each one of them is consistent with the restriction and that they are the first one that survived. They might get merged with other terms. And my claim is that this high probability, they, the number of them is small so because they are short on time. I'm just going to show you the encoding and I'm not going to show the analysis. I mean, um, it's in the paper. So here's the encoding. I'm going to take my restriction. I'm going to take all the terms that survived. There's some num there's some, this is maybe the term that survived. And then I'm going to take a random message, S. And then I'm going to fix one of them randomly. So I'm sure that the term that I'm going to fix, not based on the first one or something like that, but just based on some other information, external information I'm trying to send over this channel. And this is going to be my encoding. And my claim here, that I'm not going to prove to you here, is this technique actually allows you to bound the number of terms that are satisfied. And because we're short on time, I'm going to basically skip the analysis. I'm, I, I can post this later, you know, and people can go through it. I mean, the, the proof is not hard. I'm just going to basically test this type of calculations. Um, but I'm going to fix, skip this for now because we're short on time. What I want to focus on more here is maybe on the, on the future directions. I think that's more interesting for us to discuss this here. So just very briefly, so I showed you two types of new mild random restriction that, that allow us to analyze what happens if I fix, let's say, 1% of the variables in the DNF. The first was assuming the DNF was pseudo-random, and the second one was for arbitrary DNF, so trying to control a different parameter, DNF size. So what are some problems here? Yes. Question. Oh, no is us. Okay. Five more minutes. Okay, I'll go through the open problems and then if there's time, I can go through the proof. I can go back to the proof of the um, of the second result. But let's first talk about the open problems. It's interesting. So first question is, can this go beyond DNFs? So we use random restrictions in complexity for other computational models, like for example, decision trees. AC0 circuits, the Morgan formulas, probably more even. Can we hope to define some notion of pseudo-randomness under which we can show that mild run restrictions work as well? And maybe that could be a way to, you know, there are these limitations of proving, uh, let's say, lower bounds for AC0 circuits that seem to be st stuck at getting 
you know, truly exponential low bound sometimes because we because of the random restriction limitation. So maybe by using some sort of random assumption, we can hope to do better. So that's one open-ended direction. Another one is what measures could we hope to control? So the measures I talked about here, the one we analyzed are mostly combinatorial measures, things like becoming constant or having you know, small decision tree depth or counting the number of terms. But I think a very intriguing option is more analytical measures like Fourier coefficients. Like maybe can we use this approach to understand things like Mansour's conjecture or maybe the Fourier entropy conjecture for, you know, DNFs or some class of functions. So can we use this for analytical measures? And a third one is maybe a more technical one, but people here might be interested in it. So, you know, the switching lemma, I mean, the proof I showed you here is about analyzing the probability that the DNF becomes constant, but the full, you know, theorem talks about controlling the decision tree depth. And you can ask, can we show something similar for mild random restrictions under this pseudo-random assumption? And I'm guessing the answer is probably yes, but maybe a more interesting question is, what would that be good for? And would, what applications would that gonna have? So there's maybe a third direction. And the last one is maybe maybe even more broadly is other applications beyond complexity. So really, you know, <clears throat> if you take this sort of sunflower result we had, so the original intuition we had came from understanding random restrictions for DNFs, but then if you can actually take this result and at the very end strip away all the DNFs, you know, like if I give a, result, a talk to a combinatorics audience, it is possible to talk about this without mentioning DNFs at all. And the question is, are there other results or other questions in combinatorics or other areas in math or OCS where this could be useful? And again, my intuition here is that random restriction, maybe even more than that, encoding arguments are very powerful arguments, very powerful tools, and they should have other applications. So this is maybe my last open-ended question. And now I see our questions here. So I'm mean, based on, you know, the, the, the you no know, Avishai and Luka decide, so I can go through these questions. Or if there's more time, I can go back and give you the proof of this sort of second result. It would take maybe five minutes. So let's see. So Rupa is asking, Anup Rao used Shannon's noiseless encoding theorem, simplified the original proof of sunflower conjecture, and his bound is a little bit better. Can your new techniques further improve it? So now, so like I said, the bounds are tight. So what Anup did is he took our result combined with this Frankston AL results, and he find a way of basically doing the same encoding argument in a way that's more streamlined using information theory. And this very recent new proof by Terry Tao gives a different way of, of getting this bound by a different way of using information theory. But both of them get the same bounds as, as the Franks and Al because this bound is tight. So you can hope to do better with the same assumptions. And Puya is asking, is it possible to de-randomize such mild restriction lemmas where the stars are picked so randomly? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I haven't thought about it, but it seems very plausible. Yes. Okay, so now let's see if there are no more questions. So depending, so it's now 9.27. So, if yeah, so if you, yeah, it could be good if you want to. to okay, use so I mean, I'm going to take maybe five more minutes to go through this proof of the second result, and if people want to leave, feel free to leave. Um, so well, the first direction. So let me just ma remind you what we're trying to prove here. So this is what we're trying to prove here. So we have a DNF. We fix some terms, T1 up to Tm. I of rho are the terms that survive under the restriction rho. And surviving mean two things. First of all, they were consistent, but also if you have multiple terms that were merged to a single term, they were the first among this that, that got merged. And I'm claiming that with high probability, the number of this term that survived is not too large. It's something like one over P to the W. So how do we prove that? So I'm going to denote again by I of rho the terms that survived. And it's going to be some number of 
terms, let's say capital S terms. So I1, I2, I3 are just the indices of this term among the M terms. And let's cut again, capital S is a number of them that survived. And let small s in capital S just be a random index, unrelated to the DNF. So I'm going to think of small s as a random message that I want to send over a channel, where the channel is going to be defined by this sort of you know encoding argument, by the restriction. So I'm going to encode not just a restriction row, but this pair row and s. And I'm going to encode them as another restriction row prime and some other auxiliary information A, as follows. So first I'm going to say J is, just for simplicity of notation, IS. So S here is the index. It says, among, I know I'm going to have some capital S terms here. And I'm going to say, well, which one is... Which one is it? Which one is it? If, let's say if, if small s is one, j is going to be the first term that survived. If, if small s is two, it's going to be the second term that survived, and so on. Row prime is going to take row, and I'm going to add to it a restriction so that tj is now true. So now remember, we're assuming tj is consistent with row, it survived, so this is still valid what I'm doing here. So this is row prime. So now I'm choosing which term to fix based on this extra information, small s I got. And A is just some other information I need to recover back row. So I'm going to take row, I'm going to get these variables I fixed, variables of tj, and I'm just going to write post row under these variables. And basically I'm claiming, first of all, I can recover row and s from this row prime in A. And again, there's nothing magical here, just go step by step, right? So I know small s, I know row prime, so I know row prime. So tj is going to be the first term satisfied in it. That is not, so I can recover j. And then if I recover j, I can recover row because I know a, and then I know what, so I know row prime and I know j, tj and I know how did I change row to go from row to row prime, so we just go back. So now I have, all the information except for small s, but now if I know row and I know j and know tj, I can go through this list and I find ij, what is the index here, and I can recover small s. So again, it's like a very, very simple recovery procedure. So the only question here is why do I compress information? So again, here is the encoding procedure. Now let's do calculation. First of all, how many options do I have for this pair row and s? Well, it's a number of restrictions that fix pn variables, time basically the expected number of expected value of capital S, right? The expected number of terms that survive under the restriction. How many options do I have to row prime and A? So in row prime I fixed again at most W more variables and A has two to W options. So you have that many options. So you can do the calculation and see that will RPN is just the same, it cancels. So this proves the expected number of surviving terms is at most four over P to the W. That's it, that's a proof, very simple. And um, so it's all about finding the right encoding argument. And again, I think what's interesting here, at least for me, was that we encoded the extra information using the restriction. Okay, so this is a proof. Um, Good, so maybe now is a good time uh, to go through this. I mean, if you have any questions about anything. So maybe my question is, you know, uh, you said that uh, perhaps we can get better analysis uh, from restrictions. Do you have like some, some concrete conjecture that you, you, you would like to prove with this better analysis or, or is it? So now, okay, good question. So. In, to some extent, no. I mean, the type in these two results that we had, the bounds we got, we know they are the best op best possible up to constants. Um, one question about the sunflower is trying to use other types of um, compressions for other types of you know events it's trying to analyze. But I think going through this here is maybe in, we have some conjecture, but it's not clear 
what's true and what's not. I mean, I, I can I, I have some talks I give on the sunflower result, and then I describe some of them there. By the way, I'm going to talk about sunflower result in this uh, Boolean function analysis uh, seminar that that uh, Avishai and Posad organized. I'm going to talk more about this there. Uh, this connection of sunflowers, and and I think I think for complexity, yeah, I think the most recent ones are the more open-ended ones. But can we get this to work for other models beyond DNFs? I think that's the more interesting questions here. And also the one Pio, Pio was asking, can we randomize some of these things? And they're both very open-ended. Uh, so let's see, Igbo was asking, is this proof simpler than the one in the stock paper? You're talking which results? The one about DNF compression or the one about sunflowers? Ego? DNF, no, no, it's the same. It's the same proof as in the paper. In the paper, we need some more ingredients to get this to work. But this is what like, the main ingredient. Like, the other part that you need to do beyond that is hyperconductivity. But yeah. Now, Venkat is asking, is this easy to turn this into a high probability band? Okay, that's a very good question. So we actually had originally a way of doing that. Let me just go back to this here. Oh, wait, I'm in the wrong direction. So here was the result. So really what we're under, analyzing here is not just a um, size, but the expected size. And Venkat is asking about some high up moments. So actually, it's, originally we had some argument that could analyze higher moments, but we lost, it, it lost too much. So I think we didn't have tight analysis for higher moments. And I think this might be related to understanding sort of things like decision tree depth. They are related to higher moments. So we don't have tight tight bounds there. So Salil also raised his hand. Salil, do you want to? Oh, ask? Salil, yes. Oh yeah, I also wrote in the chat. So I just want to understand this um, encoding extra information, the sending a message viewpoint a little better, because already in the first argument you had you encoded extra information, the the term uh, true. That, that, well, that number is from true, one to m. So, so what's different? Yes. What, can yes. you elaborate on yes. what you see as different? Yes, yes, yes. Good, good question. So, so I think before we were using this, we're trying to compress something that we cared about, like a restriction, you know, that doesn't make the function constant, or a term that didn't get simplified. And we said, what information do we need to come to send so that this can be recovered? And in this second argument, we said there's this other piece of information that we don't really care about. Like I don't really care about this run message. But we're using it as a way of controlling this, this event. So we're sending more information within, and I'm thinking this, this, this encoding with really, really like a channel. And I'm adding more information to the channel so that I can actually say that, you know, the one the information I actually care about has to take even less information. So maybe that's maybe, you know, some informal way of thinking about it. But right. yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's, that's my intuition. Thanks. Okay, more questions? Right. So that, that was uh, really great. So thank, thank you, Shapo. Thank you very much for that. Uh, perfect, perfect. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um,